morning. Welcome. <laughs> welcome online and uh, welcome again, as Pastor Joe said, to those who braved Hillary this morning to come out here. We're glad you guys are all here with us today. And um, I, I had seen a video online earlier about someone in Florida comparing <laughs> how they respond to hurricanes and how we are here in California. It's so funny. Anyway, apparently we're all supposed to be at Waffle House. That's the thing. And they go to... <laughs> I was like, that's a thing in Florida. They go to Walt. <laughs> anyway, oh my gosh, um, I'm on taking Joe's place here this morning, and uh, I'm Jennifer Richmond, the lifeboat pastor here at La Mirada Church. Woohoo! And uh, it's great to be here with everybody this morning. Uh, we've been in this series through the life of Joseph called "Tested," and um, how many of you relate? <laughs> really relate? Yeah, we relate to that. I don't know how many times after church I've seen people going up to Joe saying, that was just for me. That was just for me. <laughs> and uh, Joe and I have a little joke as we're working on our messages. And my dad, who's a pastor, used to say the same thing. You know, do, during the week, during your studies, you think, if no one shows up to, for church on Sunday, it, it's okay. This was just for me. So I already know going into this, this was for sure for me as well. Um, but we relate to that idea of, uh, of testing. Um, it's part of our lives in a lot of ways. I'll tell you a story about me when I was in high school. The night before SAT test, did he still call him that? Yeah. Okay. The night before SAT test, I had one of those wake up in a cold sweat, heart racing kind of dreams. Uh, you know, I studied, I took all the, the prep exam, the classes, worked through the pages, the practice pages, all that, and uh, all the questions, drilling, days finally here. Tomorrow morning, I'd wake up, and I'd drive to that testing facility. I'd take that test. I went to sleep early, um, and I had the worst stress and anxiety-induced dream you can possibly imagine having. I dreamt that I showed up, and I took the test, um, not in my bathing suit, or I didn't miss it or anything like that. I, it wasn't that. But the pages just never ended, <laughs> like page after page, bubble after bubble, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, as I'm going through, you know, uh, I went through all the pile of Dixon Ticonderoga, number two yellow pencils are piling up around me, it's just the craziest dream. Um, so the alarm goes off, saved me from that, from that nightmare, I, I passed, went to, went to, yeah, I know, right, I'm here today. But I had to sit there and I had to stare at the ceiling for a while to kind of wake me up and get me back into reality. Like, that is, what is real here? <laughs> like, this is a lot. And, you know, life can feel like that sometimes, like a long test broken up here and there by pop quizzes. And uh, maybe you wonder, like me, am I done yet? <laughs> you know, we have this internal clock, I think, that's ticking as we continue to pray and we work through things in the season of testing that we're in. And we have in mind, I think, what we think is a reasonable timeline to go through. I mean, why not? We're born on timelines. We had a due date as soon as your mom found out she was pregnant, right? And we live within timelines and tests that start and then they finish. But what happens when the difficulty of the testing is beyond what we imagined? What happens when the season of waiting is longer than we expected? And maybe behind these kinds of questions might be an even bigger one that most of us wouldn't want to even say out loud, but it can kind of hover and hum in the back of our minds. And if anyone might have dared ask this question, it would have been Joseph. Because as we've seen, he's been tested and tested and he's waited and he's waited. So you can imagine that at some point, maybe Joseph wondered, have you let me down, God? <laughs> this is a lot harder, a lot longer. It's way more complicated than I expected. Maybe it's, it's not me. Maybe it is you, if we dare to say it out loud. And last week, Pastor Joe taught as we closed Genesis 44 with a cliffhanger. We came to that last shot of a nail-biting basketball game, and that ball is still hovering all week long. It's been spinning there. In slow motion, if you didn't catch that message, go back and listen to it. And that ball was Judah's incredible speech because the brothers finally convinced Jacob that they needed to go for food. And um, he had to do the thing that he feared most because the 12 of them reminded him that there was a no Benjamin, no food policy. So he permits Ben to go and dramatic, melancholy Jacob prepares to die, right? 
In Egypt, the brothers all are greeted, and then they're treated to this big feast, Morton Steakhouse for the one, you know, Sizzler for the other guys. They party, and they begin to head back, but um, another test. Joseph frames none other than Benjamin by putting a silver chalice in the palace with it. No, brew that is, no. Puts a, puts a chalice in his sack, and then he threatens to enslave him for the rest of his life. And this is when Judah steps up and delivers his passionate speech, appealing to Joseph that their father would die in grief if Benjamin does not go back home and he offers his own life in Benjamin's place. How will Joseph respond to Judah's request? He's looking at Judah's eyes. He scans the room, seeing the rest of the brothers, Benjamin especially. Will he have mercy on Benjamin or will he make his brothers pay for what they have done for him? It's very dramatic. Joseph's servants, well, they knew him by his Egyptian name, Zapanath Panea. The gods speak and he lives and they have been in the room hearing all of this this whole time maybe they're indignant on joseph's behalf yeah you dirty hebrews in here you know maybe they're used to life in egypt with the various gods that they need to keep happy and they're trying to remain poker faced but i mean come on they're curious how's this man who is godlike in egypt Second only to Pharaoh, how is he going to respond to this Hebrew? <laughs> They're waiting, right? Genesis 45, 1, next slide. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. Well, earlier, Joseph had been able to control his emotions. But now, Joseph tells everyone except his brothers to leave. His brothers, of course, don't know what's going on any more than those Egyptian servants did. But with his servants in attendance now out of the room, it's it's just Joseph alone with his trembling brothers. And and Joseph can't find the words yet. He just, next slide, wept aloud so that the Egyptians, Egyptians heard it. The whole household of Pharaoh heard it. The twelve are fallen on the ground, terrified, alone at the mercy of the ruler of Egypt, who had just before accused them at some point of plotting and spying, but now he's sobbing uncontrollably and loudly, so loudly it's echoing around the house and beyond. Judah's last words, the ball, still hanging in the air, I fear to see the evil that would find my father as he waits, a humbled man for the decision. Maybe. Maybe Joseph's tears are tears of fury, right? Maybe this is going to be their end, and they will see the evil that will find their father. No one can speak. Then Joseph collects himself, tears wet on his face, and in between sobs, he cries. Next slide. I am Joseph. Never in any way could these men have imagined those three words, two words in Hebrew, Ani Yosef. Surely they expected something else. I am furious. You know, maybe. I am done with all of you, possibly. I am sending Benjamin back with you, hopefully. But never, ever would it have occurred to these 12 to hear those two words from this powerful man. Think about this. Maybe the last time they heard those two or three words, it was 27 years earlier when Joseph cried out from the pit. Maybe he had screamed in shock and indignant, Hey, Ani Yosef! Joseph was daddy's favorite after all. Mom's too. And he had his sense of his own greatness to some degree. I am Joseph. How could, how could you throw me into a pit? But his brothers laughed, and they just walked away. They carried the blood-stained coat, thinking they had put an end to his crazy dreams. And yet here they were again, hearing his name, Joseph. They haven't even processed Ani Yosef when he asks a very disorienting question. Next slide. Is my father alive? (laughs) I mean, if you're down on the ground, try this. Like, down on the ground, and you're looking up. What? what? Did I hear what he just said? How did they respond? Well, they didn't. They couldn't. His brothers, next slide, could not answer him, for they were dismayed or terrified or troubled at his presence, not believing what they were seeing or, or hearing. No place in their mind for this revelation. And Joseph realizes what they need. 
And he says it in verse 4. Next slide. Come near to me. Now, tone means everything. Have you ever told your child? <laughs> Come here. All right? Tone. We don't know. We don't know the tone. A direct command, come near to me. Not come to me, not come, but what? Come near to me with arm's reach, right? Maybe. Remember in Genesis 44, it says that they had fallen to the ground before Joseph. Remember that Judah was the only one who actually stood before Joseph to plead for Benjamin's life. The others are likely still lowered, only daring to look up nervously as the whole scene unfolds. Come near to me. And Joseph softens the command by adding... Next slide, please. And they come near. I think this is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. And it only is beautiful because you know what's going to happen next. I assume most of you know. But we don't really know the tone here because you've said it as a parent. <laughs> come here, please. <laughs> right? It could have been. But we know what's going to happen next, so this becomes the most beautiful verse. <laughs> You hear Joseph's strong command. You hear the urgency made gentle by please, please. I know you're scared. I know this is going to be more than you can handle, but come near to me. And the power of the overshadowing, the foreshadowing of what Christ does for us is just incredible in this. Come near to me, please. Mercy was in Joseph's power, but so was damnation. Punishment, retribution. Joseph's brothers heard the words, but they had to respond. We do as well. Next slide. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy to find grace to help in time of need. He is able to save to the uttermost those who do what? Draw near to God through him. Up till this moment, they're in the room, but they're at a distance, an honorable and appropriate distance from this ruler, a stranger really to them. But now he's telling them, I'm not some ruler or a stranger. Next slide. They came near. He said, I am your brother, Joseph. Next slide. Not just any Joseph. He's helping them by adding another important detail. I am your brother. And if there's any doubt remaining, he adds the clincher, the one detail that no one could have known. Only 13 men alive knew this detail. And they were the only ones left in that room. They are at the mercy of this man. And now they've inched close enough. They've come near and they're at their most vulnerable. This man has stopped wailing standing close enough to touch each one as they come near to him. And the ruler of Egypt says that they're, he's their brother? Why? Like, what would this man stand to gain by identifying with these miserable sheep herders, these destitute foreigners? What is going on? This makes no sense. But how would Joseph prove it? <laughs> he's a clean-shaven Egyptian. He wears the robe of royalty, the traditional headdress, the scepter, the ring of Pharaoh. He doesn't smell like fields, doesn't smell like sheep like these brothers do. What would he say? What piece of information that only they know could he say? I am your brother, the one that had that colorful coat, right? <laughs> well, they remember that. They're going to make a musical about that someday. <laughs> the one who was your dad's favorite. <laughs> that would strike a chord, right? Or how about the one who had the dreams? Ta-da! <laughs> Look at that! You're all doing it right now. Remember the dream? Yeah. I mean, he could have said all that. He could have reveled in his glory. He could have made all these true statements. And they would all have proven who he was. But instead, he, he chooses to identify himself as the one whom you sold into Egypt. <laughs> Whoa. Now, again, you know the end of this story. They do not. Is there anything he said right now what the and therefore is going to be? There's nothing. He's just revealing facts right now. That's it. There's no and therefore. And therefore. And there's a lot of possibilities. So Joseph must have seen the terror in their eyes. And, and their hearts would have probably melted if Joseph hadn't quickly and compassionately, verse 5, next slide, said this. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. And think about it. Again, we don't know what the end re result's going to be. We don't. Just saying, don't be worried or distressed. Because you can stay and you can pay for all this by working in my fields. You could have said that. Or don't worry. 
you can be my personal attendance. <laughs> he has every right and all the power to make them pay. <laughs> he identifies himself as the one they sold. And he adds, next slide, God sent me before you to preserve life. At this point, do you hope that they're hoping it's their life? Because they don't know still. God sent me. Not to punish you when you finally get here. Not to make sure you got what you deserve for all the pain and suffering you caused me. No. Why? I mean, why did God send Joseph to Egypt? Why didn't God just intervene? Why didn't he miraculously stop the brothers 27 years ago? I mean, he, Joseph's been through a lot. And it wasn't fair. <laughs> And God could have stepped in at any moment and just plucked Joseph right out of all that trouble. Why didn't he just cushion the blow and let Joseph land softly in that pit? Or let him escape somehow? Or, 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 or all the things that we could imagine God doing when we're busy thinking about how he surely won't let us down. He surely will get us out of the pain. He surely will stop the loss, the death, the illness, he will fill in the blank. Consider this. Maybe God is looking further down the road than we can imagine. <laughs> Egypt was surely nowhere in their imaginations. Maybe just maybe God has in mind something so big, so incredible, with so many more lives to save than their tiny minds can conceive. And maybe we could take this passage and place it on our nightstand post it on our mirror, wrap it around our wrist, print it on a t-shirt, keep it handy as always in a forever reminder that if God did what he did in Joseph's and their lives with those 12 angry men and that one entitled dreamer, he might just be able to do something amazing in our lives as well. Yeah, they sold him, but it was God who sent him to do what? Preserve life. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. I mean, that's the swish, right? You sold me, but God sent me. And what's amazing, both are true. Joseph had been so incredibly filled with confidence in God, so incredibly strong in his faith to be able to stand there trembling, not with vengeance coursing through every cell in his body, but with mercy and grace and delight and even relief seeing before his very eyes the culmination of every dream come true in that moment and overcome by the reality of it all, that the dust of the pits and the dung in that prison and the false accusation and all of it, just all of it, was worth it to be a part of God's redeeming plan. But wait, there's more. <laughs> and, and this is kind of a good news, bad news part, or maybe weird news, crazy news, what in the world is going on news part. Joseph! Drops this on them also. Remember the famine, super famine that we've been having for the past two years. Yeah, the reason why you're here to begin with. Well, there's going to be five more. Next slide. <laughs> a famine has been in the land for these two years, and there's going to be five more years coming in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. They're, they aren't even processing who this guy is yet, not fully. And he's letting them know that their circumstances really aren't going to change much. Yeah, your brother's a co-ruler of the free world. And yeah, there are going to be some perks. We're going to get to that in a minute. But it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad for a while longer as far as food and livelihood goes. So again, Joseph brings him to church. Hey, I know you're still processing who I am, but I need to understand something. This isn't about you. <laughs> it's not about your timing. It's not about your plans. It's not your ideas. It's not your mistakes. When you're rationalizing of things or even your attempt at making it right. Thanks for that, Judah. You know, try. Nice try. All right, next slide. Remember this, for God sent me. Why is Joseph here? God. Not God brought me, not God made me go. No, God sent me. We love to imagine the scene in the Bible when God calls someone and they respond, here I am, send me. Right? And it's great to imagine that wonderful way that he's going to use us when we're sent by God. But don't forget, God sent Joseph to get his brothers that day in the field. And God sent Joseph into that pit. And God sent Joseph into that prison. Just because God sends you doesn't mean you're going to keep your nice coat, remain dad's favorite, live on the family land, eating lamb chops, singing a kumbaya around the fire. Maybe see a, a pit 
There might be a prison in your future. And so Joseph clarifies, listen, God sent me, and yes, a pit was involved, so was prison, but next slide. God sent me before you to do something no one could ever imagine, to preserve. There's that word again. Preserve. And not just life in general, as in Egypt and the surrounding nations, but to preserve something specific. To preserve what? A remnant on earth. Why would this be so important? Well, Joseph is actually echoing words of Genesis when Noah and his family were the remnant, the only ones left after the flood. God preserved them, and God is going to preserve Joseph's family. Not only that, but God plans to keep alive for you many survivors or to save your lives by a great deliverance, your translation might read. What, what language is the Old Testament written in originally? Eh, they got it. All right. And uh, all right. who wrote down this account? Moses, correct again. So Moses is recording this event, and he's alluding to a great deliverance to come, and isn't he? Of course, the brothers and Joseph have in mind their personal deliverance right now, because that's what's right here, and that's what they want. Joseph is in a position to keep them safe and fed during this famine, and that's definitely a great deliverance. But in writing the account, Moses has been the leader of a remnant that remained and flourished, and ultimately who he, by God's hand, led out of Egypt and back to the promised land. And that's an incredible account we're going to study in Bible study. Ladies, make sure you join us this year. So, all right, Joseph continues like a preschooler, kind of spelling, a preschool teacher, kind of spelling things out in detail, one layer at a time, and he states it again. He states the things now, this time in reverse order. Next slide. So, just so we're clear, uh, it was not you who sent me here. Who was it, class? God. Turn over in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Next slide. It was God. In Acts chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 22 or so, um, it's about 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, and Peter is speaking to the Jewish leaders, telling them about Jesus, explaining to them uh, the terrible reality of what they did, and, and yet the incredible truth about how it happened. Next slide. This Jesus, or this slide, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You killed him, yes, but it was guy God's definite plan. This is the incredible truth about God and its priorities working in our lives. When it comes to bringing about God's purpose, he'll use our own plans, the dumb ones, the self-righteous ones, even the evil ones to deliver us. <laughs> because Jesus didn't just die to deliver the good people. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have made it, right? Jesus died for the very people who held the nails and shouted, crucify him. Jesus wasn't, Joseph also wasn't brought to Egypt just to save the good people from starvation. He saved the very people who betrayed him, and not just the brothers. Consider this, who benefited from the plan? I mean, anyone who could come to Joseph and get grain, it was available to anyone. That means the slave traders who carried Joseph off, they could have come back later and gotten food in Egypt. And Potiphar's wife, I mean, remember that horrible woman? She entrapped Joseph. She caused him to go to prison. She's eating food because Joseph was brought to Egypt. The cupbearer who forgot Joseph leaving him to languish in prison for two years. God worked it all out so there would be many survivors. And Joseph continues explaining that while he was fatherless in Egypt, God did something incredible. Next slide. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler of all the land of Egypt. Ab is the word for father in Hebrew. Joseph doesn't mean he's literally Pharaoh's father. It's a figure of speech in Hebrew, meaning he's trusted and he's really close, has Pharaoh's ear. So he tells him, and, and you can hear, you know, his enthusiasm, it's building. He repeats literally what he just said. Next slide. Hurry up and go get my father. My father, Abi, the personal, precious, my father. Not like the figurative meaning when he said he was a father, La Ab, to Pharaoh. I've been like a father to Pharaoh, but I haven't lost I haven't lost a place in my own heart for my father. And notice that he skips the detail about being a pharaoh to father when he tells the brothers what to say. Thus says your son, Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. And notice also that Joseph doesn't mention the you sold me part. <laughs> Why? Well, because, listen, as true as that is, and it's true, that's a distraction. The sin, our failures... Failures of others, distraction. The point is to point to God. Yes, they sold him, but God. 
God has made this great thing come about. You know, Solomon captures the beautiful nature of God in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He said it this way. Next slide. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He's made in the human heart. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And that's a big understatement, isn't it? No one can fathom what God has done start to finish. Joseph's brothers, they, they couldn't. Even Joseph himself really had no idea. I mean, he knew his part for this moment. He didn't know where it was all going. We do. We got the story. We got it right here. When we wish that we could understand what God is up to, has been doing, or will do, know this. He knows, and that's honestly good enough. Joseph continues with some great details to sweeten the message. Oh, you're not just coming up for a visit. Oh, no, Joseph must have been busy preparing a place because he had land set aside and ready. Next slide. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you. I thought of everything. Incredible mercy. Abundant grace. Undeserved blessing. You shall dwell. You have a new place to live. You shall be near. We're going to be together again. You shall be provided for by me. You will lack for nothing because Ani Yosef, I am Joseph, your brother, the father to Pharaoh, the lord of the house, the ruler of Egypt. I'll provide. Why? Well, in all this good news, let's not forget the reality that they're living in. So Joseph spells the truth out one more time. Next slide. There are years, still, in case you forgot, five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And Joseph reminds them to repeat the good news, bad news thing. You shall dwell. You shall be near me. I will provide for you. Provision or poverty, those are your choices. But it's even stronger when you understand how life worked in the ancient Near East. And that root of the Hebrew word translated here, poverty, it's uh, yarash or yeresh, has the meaning of inheritance. Without an inheritance, what are you? Well, in our culture, if we don't get an inheritance, oh, well, I don't have a rich uncle, right? But in theirs, that's all you had. Without an inheritance, you're destitute. You're impoverished. And that's what Joseph is saying in very strong wording. Come with me if you want to live. (laughs) And again, we see the foreshadowing of Jesus in our lives. (laughs) We dwell with him. We're near to him. He provides for us. We're still in the land of famine, aren't we? In this world, we will have tribulation. But I've overcome the world. Come with me. That's where your inheritance lies. Next slide. Now you see. Now you see. Eyes of my brother, Benjamin, see. It's my mouth that speaks to you. Joseph must have been finally seeing that they were grasping the situation. You see, Benjamin sees. It's like this testimony moment. You've seen. Now you need to respond to my words. And, and what next? Next slide. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. And when you see, when you hear, when you know that reality, you're expected to do something with that. Go, tell. (laughs) Be quick about it. Bring in others who need to know so they can hear and see and experience the great good news. And let me connect that to us right here today at La Mirada Church. You know our mission. Pastor Joe spoke it at the beginning. Know the word. Love like Jesus. Transform our communities. When we know the word, it's more than just hearing the words. What if that's all Joseph Brothers did? They just heard his words. Good story, Joe. Bounce back. <laughs> they had to do something. They had to go down. They had to go. It's grasping the reality. It's becoming delighted by the good news, relieved by the good news, and doing what Joseph is telling his brothers to do. Go. This is too good to miss out on. Get the rest of the family so they can get in on this. And, and again, Pastor Joe shared at the beginning of the today about the fall groups that are starting up again in September. Be a part of those groups. Youth, youth, where's my youth? (laughs) If you're in junior high or high school, make youth group a priority. Young adults, where's my young adults? College and up, you guys, you all get involved. Men and women, where's our men and women? (laughs) 
Get to Bible study. That's the heart of the life at La Mirada Church. We have a big vision. We have a big vision that 100% of those who come on Sundays will also be connected with the group midweek. And I realize that's a big goal. But you know something incredible? Listen, listen. 100% of the people that were invited by Joseph to come down to Goshen and dwell there came. 100%. (laughs) <laughs> Not one person stayed back and thought, you know, that sounds good. I don't have time. <laughs> I'm fine living off scraps of this super famine. <laughs> or I don't like new things. Or I've been to Egypt before. I got my own little group up here. It's kind of hard to get to Egypt. No, no, no. And <laughs> listen, the old men came. The old women came. The young, midlife, the little guys, everybody in between came. They all heard. They all responded. They all took Joseph up on the offer to go where they could be fed and where they could flourish. And I'm asking you to do the same today. You're not too young. You're not too old. We have a place for you to grow and be blessed. And you know what else? You can bless others. This is your church. This is your place to be active. Sunday's great. It is. It's great. But Sunday is sitting. Sunday's receiving. That's nice. But the life in the community of the church is so much more. 100%. That's what we're shooting for this fall. And at this point, Joseph says what he needed to say, and now it's hugs all around. Next slide. He fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and Benjamin wept on his. All the years missed together come swirling back to them. Next slide. He kissed his brothers and wept on them. After that, his brothers talked with him. (laughs) The speechless brothers finally speak. Of course they did. I mean, up to this point, Joseph's been doing all the talking. But now they're all talking, and, and they got a lot to catch up on. Maybe some explanations, maybe apologies. And Joseph taps his heart. No, no, man, it's all about God, you know. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, it's about God, right? Let me ask you again. <laughs> Does God let you down? <laughs> in this season of testing in your life, is he making a way for you? Is it possible he's taking longer than you expected? <laughs> it's harder than you imagine? Is God letting you down as you wait? I know you know the answer. But what if God's plan doesn't involve anything you've dreamt of? Joseph had his dreams, but he never even imagined this. I mean, Joseph had his speech, and he was willing, uh, Judah had his speech, and he was willing to make that ultimate sacrifice, but he had no idea what was going to happen. Jacob had, well, he had a pity party, uh, and there was no room in his mind for this. What about you? Are you willing to accept the possibility that the greatest thing God will do for you is what he's already done? What if your thoughts today for what you think and hope will happen in that situation that you care about and need, maybe you need to leave those in the pit. Maybe you need to put them back in the prison or even in the palace. And you need to just say, God, whatever happens, I already have everything. I have you. You called me near when I deserve to be sent away. Please come, you said, and you saved me, and you invited me to dwell and and live close with you, and you provided for my needs. You're good, you're good, you're so good. You went to the cross for me. (laughs) You're preparing a place for me. That's it. I'll just keep my eyes on you. I've heard the words. I've seen with my eyes, and now I'll just go like Joseph's brothers, and I'll dwell, and I'll dwell faithfully, and I'll just leave the rest to you. Has God let you down? No, never has, never, never will. You can trust him, draw near to him. Please come, he says, I've provided for you. We're going to have some time for communion. I'll invite the worship team to come up right now. We're going to have some time for communion. It's set up on the tables in the back. And while we worship, I invite you to pray. I invite you to release it all back again to God. To confess your sins to receive forgiveness again, to thank him for what he's done. Ask God to help you see any areas that you need to truly surrender to him. Do you need prayer? Pastor Joe and I are going to be right down here. Maybe you can give your life to him today. Maybe you need to recommit to him. We want to pray with you. So we'll sit in the front and we'll, we'll be there for you this morning. Would you all stand with me? We're going to prepare our hearts for communion and worship. But I'm going to close today with this prayer from Ephesians. And I, I want to pray this from all my heart. For each of us, would you bow your heads and pray? That out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge 
that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.